statements of condemnations actually never convinced Israel to stop its massacre of the Palestinian people. I remember very well that on the, I think it was the fifth day, of course we couldn't sleep for 22 days. And again, I'm not saying this because we need sympathy. No, we do not need sympathy. I mean, it is, I mean, as Nelson Mandela said, it is equality or nothing. It is equality or nothing. And we want equality. I remember on the fifth day, I was listening to news, and they said they shelled the Sheikh Radwan Cemetery. We, we had already buried my mother in 2005. I lost my parents in 2005. And they said that they shelled this. Even the dead, they were after the dead. Not only the living, but also the dead. I mean, what kind of mentality is that? I mean, that is the question that crosses one's mind. I mean, I claim to be, well, in a way, an intellectual, a conscious person, and I can't understand it. I really cannot understand it. And I would really like people, I mean, you have an experience here in Germany, and I'm glad to hear what you have to say. I mean, to target dead people. So I had to rush to the cemetery, because they said that dead parts of the dead people were thrown out on the street. And I wanted to pick up the dead parts of my mother. I mean, why do something like this? So the message was very clear. The international community did not react in February, March 2008. And that is why Israeli occupation forces came back on the 27th of December 2008, and they carried out a horrific massacre. A horrific massacre. I mean, we are talking about 1,400 people. The population of Gaza is what, almost about 1.5 million. And what happened then? Well, at the end of the massacre, about six, I remember, six European leaders had a press conference with Ehud Olmert. And Ehud Olmert thanked them for their understanding of Israel's need to defend itself, to defend its security. Its security against the Palestinian children of Gaza. Its security against firecrackers, the so-called Qassam, Qassam rockets. And I strongly believe, I mean, one, I remember reading one of the interviews, and I'm sure Ilan and Ali and Lubna and Mazen know this very well. One of the soldiers in one of the interviews, in Haaris, he said, and I actually, I want to quote exactly what he said for you to understand. I can paraphrase it, but I prefer to quote it. He said, that is what is so nice, supposedly, about Gaza. You see a person on a road, walking along a path. He doesn't have to be with a weapon. You don't have to identify him with anything, and you can just shoot him, unquote. So, why not, why not expect another massacre on a larger scale tomorrow or the day after tomorrow? I mean, the international community will do absolutely nothing. And notice, according to Haaretz, and I remember it out, Ahronaut, mainstream, Israeli newspapers, 94% of Israeli Jews supported the war on Gaza, the massacre of Gazans. After that, Israel had elections, and Israelis de Israeli Jews decided to vote for the most fascist government in the history of the state of Israel since its inception, establishment 1948. We are talking about Avigdor Lieberman here. We're talking about Avigdor Lieberman. And if you don't know who Avigdor Lieberman, Avigdor Lieberman supports the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Lubna Masarwe will be with her family and the village that she comes from will very soon be ethnically cleansed. Gideon Levy, a courageous Israeli journalist, had this to say before the massacre. He said, Israel now looks very much like the Germany of the 1930s. And this rings a bell. I mean, this rings a bell. Now, this is a warning. This is a very serious warning. And what are you going to do about it? I mean, there is a parallel here. History, well, if history, history does not repeat itself. But if it does, it repeats itself either as a tragedy I didn't say this, Marx said this, or as a farce. And actually it is repeating itself as a tragedy and a farce in Palestine. So now, 
after the massacre, we expected the international community to say, well, no more siege, no more blockade. Palestinians, the Palestinians of Gaza should live a normal life like you, like Israeli Jews in Israel, like everybody. But unfortunately, no. Because in 2006, that is the reason. That's one of the major reasons. In two th January 2006, the Palestinians naively believed that they could go to the polling station, vote a party that neither the Americans nor the Israelis like, and the Palestinians voted for Hamas. That doesn't mean that all Palestinians or most Palestinians support Hamas. No. The Palestinians were fed up with the fiction of the two-state solution. In 1993, Yasser Arafat signed the infamous Oslo Accords, which the late Edward Said called Second Nakba. Negotiations continued, actually until today, 17 years, and actually the number of settlers has increased from 193,000 in 1993 to more than half a million now in the, in, in the West Bank, and of course Eastern Jerusalem is part of the, of, of the West Bank. We are not talking about settlements, outposts here and there. We are talking about cities. People who come from the West Bank, and Mazin will comment on this. I mean, Gilo, Ariel, we are talking about big cities here. You have half a million people living there. And then, that means, and I have said, in one of the articles, and I compared the Gaza massacre to the, to the Sharpeville massacre in 1960. Now, in, the, in Sharpeville, Sharpeville massacre in 1960 in South Africa, the racist white South African police killed 69 people. And that led, in a way, in a way to the intensification of the BDS campaign against apartheid South, South Africa. Um, some British intellectuals called Gaza, not the Sharban, they called it the Guernica of our time. The Guernica of our time. Everybody knows Guernica, and now everybody knows Sharpeville. Now, now the question is, what are we going to do about this? Really, I mean, the international community I remember very well Margaret Thatcher, Ronald, Rene, Ronald Reagan, calling Nelson Mandela a terrorist in the mid-80s. All right? I mean, the mid-80s, they said, okay, that is, you know, a terrorist. And we are called terrorists. Our leaders are called terrorists. But South Africans never gave up because they led a fantastic campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. BDS boycott, divestment, and sanctions. It intensified in the late 80s. The American government, which had wonderful ties with the apartheid regime, the European governments were forced, actually, to boycott apartheid South Africa. They didn't do that because they like black South Africans. They didn't do that because they support um, the, the struggle of black South Africans, they did that because they were forced by civil society organizations. Because of the formation, for example, the formation of the Black Caucus in the United States of America. Now I have been told by some comrades here that there are issues that are very sensitive in Germany. You cannot talk about BDS. You cannot talk about boycott. Because of the history, because of the historical background, actually, I don't care. I don't care. I'm sorry to say that. I really and honestly don't care. Because that is not my problem. I don't want to be punished for crimes that I did not commit. Now, if you are feeling, if somebody is feeling guilty, they can deal with that guilt complex away from me. I don't, our children don't have to pay the, to pay the price for that. And so we don't care. And we are going to continue our struggle. We are going to continue our struggle led by BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. There is a huge gap. There is a huge power imbalance between the oppressor and the oppressed. Israel has, according to some military experts, the fourth strongest army in the world, equipped with F-16s, F-15s, Merkava tanks, Apache helicopters made in the United States of America. What do Palestinians have? They have 
they have stones and they have their strong will. They have their strong will. Exactly like black South Africans. Black South Africans, the oppressed in South Africa, had their strong will. Nelson Mandela never compromised. And when he negotiated, he had this to say. He said, only free men can negotiate. Only free men can negotiate. And we are saying, we had meetings with, um, Felicia mentioned something about you know, the ANC and the BDS. We had meetings with the leadership of the ANC, um, COSATO, the South African Trade Unions, South African Communist Party, and so on and so forth. And this is what they had to tell us. They said, well, what, you had ma what you've managed to achieve within three or four years is more than what we had achieved within 30 years in terms of BDS. In terms of BDS. Now we have the BNC, Boycott National Committee, representing most Palestinians, almost all political organizations and almost all civil society organizations have endorsed the 2005 BDS call issued by, <coughs> excuse me, more than one, 170 civil society organizations calling on the international community to intervene, to put an end to this horror taking place in, in, in Palestine. And Palestinians, by the way, are not only those who live in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. These are, or rather those are, or represent one third of the Palestinian people. So even if we have an independent Palestinian state on 22% of the historic land of Palestine, how does that guarantee the return of about 6 to 7 million Palestinian refugees living in the diaspora, most of whom living in miserable conditions in refugee camps in, 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 in Lebanon, in Lebanon and, and, and Jordan and, and Syria. How does that guarantee the national and cultural rights of Lubna Masarwa and her family? More than 1.2 million Palestinians living as third, if not fourth, class citizens in the state of Israel. These are the indigenous population of, 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 of Palestine. And therefore, I think if we really want to have peace with justice, comprehensive peace with justice, the one state, the one state solution, a secular democratic state a la South Africa is the way forward. We need actually, we need actually to forget about the fiction of the taste food solution and start thinking about creative ways of bringing about peace with justice. The blacks of South Africa never accepted less than equality. They never said, they never accepted the Bantustan system. Now what is happening in Palestine, exactly like what Felicia had to say, is a process of Bantustanization. The West Bank has been bantustanized, has been sliced into three pieces, northern part of the West Bank, the middle and the south, and the Gaza Strip, and I'm sorry if you are too sensitive to hear this, has been transformed into the largest concentration camp on earth. And it is now time for us, with your help, with international support. You are the international community. It is time for, for us to say enough is enough. Thank you very much for listening to me. Sheikh Radwan Cemetery. We, we had already buried my mother in 2005. I lost my parents in 2005. And they said that they shelled this. Even the dead, they were after the dead. Not only the living, but also the dead. I mean, what kind of mentality is that? We need sympathy. No, we do not need sympathy. I mean, it is, I mean, as Nelson Mandela said, it is equality or nothing. It is equality or nothing. And we want equality. I remember on the fifth day, I was listening to news, and they said they shelled the sh statements of condemnations actually never convinced Israel to stop its massacre of the Palestinian people. I remember very well that on the I think it was the fifth day. Of course, we couldn't sleep for 22 days. And again, I'm not saying this because we are dead people. So I had to rush to the cemetery because they said that dead parts of the dead people were thrown out on the street. And I wanted to pick up the dead parts of my mother. 
I mean, why do something like this? So the message was very clear. I mean, that is the question that crosses one's mind. I mean, I claim to be, well, in a way, an intellectual, a conscious person, and I can't understand it. I really cannot understand it. And I would really like people, I mean, you have an experience here in Germany, and I'm glad to hear what you have to say. I mean, to 